I think you all can clap for yourselves there. All right, let's sing this song. I'm gonna invite you all who are able to stand to stand as we sing this song this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. of a way it was my turn till I could I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was mine too Till I met you Yeah You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Like a craftsman with their tools, we all have something to offer. We have been designed with a purpose and have opportunities to influence, encourage, and inspire those around us. And simply put, it comes down to identifying the answer to one question. What is in your hand? We believe the answer to this question lies in how God designed us and what he designed us for. If you have a desire to love and lead those around you, you won't want to miss the Move Out Gathering. We have Dave Nelson, lead pastor of K2 The Church in Salt Lake City. What God is trying to help all of us understand, it's not about the job that we're doing, it's about the essence of who he's created us to be. 
We have the privilege of hearing from Brian Peterson, a designer from Kia who started a nonprofit for the homeless of Southern California. Usually, as we paint people, they go from like fans to friends, and then some become like family. And Danielle Strickland, author, speaker, and co-founder of four organizations. Love is a means by which you can unlock the kind of servanthood that has no agenda, which is so powerful. There will also be several workshops to choose from. You are an influencer. You have relationships. You have an opportunity to discover not only how you were crafted, but what you were crafted for. Hey, good morning, everyone. How you guys all doing? Good stuff. Thanks for braving the cold. Thanks for braving the snow and everything. And so glad that you are here. For those of you who are joining us via stream, wherever you are, grateful that you are with us as well. And so something that we believe is that we believe that God has given every single one of us skills, abilities, and resources. And how he desires for us to use these things, these gifts, is to move out and to impact the people and the world around us. And as we just saw in this video, this is what we're gonna be talking about at the Move Out Gathering. And I'm really excited, and so I'm gonna be there and, um, with my family group, and so we would love for you to not only be there, but invite somebody to come with you as well, because this weekend is going to be inspiring, it's going to be motivating, and hopefully open our eyes to new things that God wants us to see. And so if you want to be there or if you'd like to more information about the event, all you have to do is go to our website or our app as well. Also, right now is a great time for us to jump into a course or a group if we want to connect in order to connect with God and other people in a greater way. And we offer so many different courses, so many groups here at Kensington. And to tell us more about uh, one particular group and her experience, I want to invite Ashley up. Ashley, why don't you come on up? Can we give her a huge hand, everyone? Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. And so, Ashley, you are a part of Financial Peace University, so we'd love for you to share a little bit more about what that is and also how it impacted your life. Absolutely. So I was sitting just where you are uh, this past fall, and I heard Brett stand right where I am and tell his story of how Financial Peace University impacted his life and his family's life and how he was only a couple payments away from paying off his student loans. So I had to figure out what this class was all about. Um, when I, the first day, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know what, you know, what was gonna come of it. But I walked in a room, a business professional as myself, and I was amongst doctors and pharmacists and dentists and retirees and people with all different incomes, with all different goals, but we were there to reach financial freedom and learn those biblical steps that would help us get there. So. I've made so much progress since the class ended, and um, I've paid off my, my car, my credit cards, and now I'm on to student <laughs> loans. <laughs> the last hurdle. The last <laughs> hurdle, and what initially I thought would take 10, 15 years plus for me to pay off, now I'm able to do it within the next few years, and I am so happy, I'm so excited. I was there, I could be transparent. I was in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And I highly encourage all of you or any of you who have any financial goals, and it doesn't matter your income, if you have any goals and you want to learn those biblical principles in order to help you get there, Financial Peace University is the class for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Can we give her another hand, everyone? Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. And I love what she said about, especially about financial freedom and about just being in a room and being with people from all walks of life. And that's one of the great things about our groups and our courses, that we get to meet people and develop relationships with people from all different walks of life, all different careers and different life stages and all of that. And so if you would like more information about any of our courses or our groups, all you have to do is go out to the hub and you'll see people out there in the lobby with bright orange shirts on. Love for you to have a conversation with them. Or you can also go to our website or our app to learn more and to jump in. In there as well. And so we are in the second week of our series Sermons from the Seats, and it is going to be another powerful weekend. And our lead pastor, Danny Cox, is going to be up in a moment to lead us in that. But before we get to that, I want to invite all of us to stand. Let's say hello to somebody around us.
God of creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you You let 
All right, you there? Good. That's actually one of my favorite songs that we do. And partly because it speaks to the enormity and the magnitude of God. The one that spoke creation into existence. The one that hung the moon and the stars, that's what scripture says. And so it really speaks to this unbelievable magnitude of God. And then it, then it starts to speak into the intimacy of God. How he will come for the one, for you, for me, for all creation. That he would actually, this, this huge God would actually come close. And then it speaks to the inherent part of our life, this DNA that was placed in us to actually worship. You realize that we're all made to worship and that we all worship. Maybe you've come today, you don't realize that, but we do. It's just what we worship. And I love how that song really connects all of creation worshiping God, that we are designed to worship God. And many times we don't worship God. We'll be worshiping all other things. A friend of mine says uh, that where the attention goes, the power flows. And I would say to all of us today, including myself, the things in our life, the aspects of our life that we give the most attention and that we dream about and we think about and it's on top of our mind are the things that we worship. And God said, would you worship me first? Would I be top of mind? And so we're gonna look at that today. We're actually gonna look through the lens of two women. One woman that lived 2,000 years ago and it was close personal friends with Jesus and another woman that has lived in our context right now, right here, and both of them worshiping in a unique way to God. So I think it's just gonna be a beautiful uh, second week of this series that we're calling Sermons from the Seats. Uh, if you were here last week, you know that we just had a beautiful time together. By the way, welcome. Uh, my name is Danny. If you're brand new, welcome here. Welcome to everyone on the stream. Uh, I do wanna just really uh, lift you up this morning because you made the trek. You are the brave people, right? And so here's what I want everyone on stream to know. Because you came today, you're all getting a new car. And everyone on stream, you're paying for it. No, <laughs> like it's, it's a matchbox car, but that's okay. No, we're grateful that you're here. But last week was really a, a, a very powerful week, and we told the story of Scott Newport in this series called Sermons from the Seats, where we're looking at actual stories in our seats that are, are, are influencing or even writing the sermon that we're gonna say. In fact, today, uh, the sermon that I'm gonna give today is really heavily influenced and written by the person we're gonna tell the story about at the end, Elizabeth. But last week we talked, uh, told a story about Scott Newport and his son Evan. Uh, his son Evan only lived seven years. He had a really intense disease, but his seven-year life, this little life that happened, is impacting thousands now. And at the end of the service, we had a bunch of coins or tokens that were made that had the image of this foundation that, that Evan is a part of and that Scott's a part of. And we had those on the stage, and we asked everyone, because we talked about the groanings and the hurts of our life, what hurts and groanings do you have in your life that you want? to surrender to God and you want to lay them down and then you want to pick that up, this, this hope kind of chip that you'll put in your pocket and carry with you for the rest of the year or at least this month or whatever, put it in a place where you can be reminded that there's even hope in the groanings and the hurts of our life. And it was an amazing moment. I'm always moved when our community comes up and lays down their burdens. And so I wanted you to know something, uh, that when you did that, there was probably well over 1,000, probably close to maybe even 2,000. We just gathered all of those up, those written notes. And this past week as a staff, a Troy staff, we sat in the lobby and we opened up a big chunk of those, read every one and prayed over them. And I want you to know something, that our prayer team is going to pray over every single one. And it's always moving to me to read some of these. Listen to some of the burdens, some of the groanings of our community. One says, uh, my groaning I'm carrying, where I want God to enter in, the purpose of my life for the last 15 years, for myself and for the world, what feels to me like idleness, wasted time, drifting, feeling like I'm sitting on the bench. I want to and I'm ready to energetically participate in life with God. This one says, Lord, help me to be the mom the wife and the leader that you've called me to be, help me to shake this feeling that I'm not enough. How many of you had that feeling? I've had that feeling. Another one says, hope in total surrendering unto God only. Last one, it says, God, I know that you're not done with me. And just a reminder, as you walked in today, you might feel like maybe God's done with you. I just wanna remind you, God's never done with you, ever. And it says, you know, Lord, I wanna know that you're not done with me. It's only begun, please give me the courage and the patience in this waiting period, I trust you. Isn't that beautiful? There are so many of those. And when you really start to feel the burden, then we can carry those burdens together. In fact, that's what God asked us to do. And so it's a beautiful moment uh, last week for our community. And I'm, I'm excited about this week as well because we're gonna be talking about how 
do we live out our lives so that our lives go beyond just this life? How do we live out our lives and have a picture of something bigger? How can our lives become a bigger legacy? And we're gonna look through, like I said, the lens of a particular woman that has lived in our time and that actually uh, inspired this whole series, Elizabeth. And it's really based off of a sermon that I gave at her memorial service this past year. And so let me pray and then we'll dive in and we'll see what happens this particular service. Lord, thank you. Uh, thank you for all these brave souls here that braved the weather. Thank you for everyone joining us on stream. Lord, today we want to hear your heart as we always do. But Father, I would ask that you would give us a bigger picture of our life. Not just what's in front of us, but the eternal view. And let us know, Lord, that when we have that, we live our lives differently. We see the world differently. We see ourselves differently. We see you differently. And in turn, Lord, that becomes we live differently. So let us get a glimpse of you in eternity, the one that hung the moon and the stars. Let us feel you in the intimate parts of our life, even in our groanings and the parts that we are hurting. Would you enter in and then would you give us a different perspective? We thank you for that, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, life goes by fast, doesn't it? Do you feel that? Yes? You can talk to me. Do you feel like that? Life can just go. I remember when I was growing up, my father would always talk about it. My parents would talk about that. They're, Life just goes by so fast. And as a kid, I'm thinking, no, it doesn't. This is awesome. Probably because I had no responsibility whatsoever, and I was just having the time of my life. But as you start getting older and you start having more responsibility, you start to really feel it. And I remember as a kid, my dad would play songs like Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chabin, talking about their kids growing up so fast and they're missing it. And then he'd be like, man, this song really hits my heart. And I'm like, Dad, come on. It's so lame. And then you get to a certain age, you're like, oh my gosh, my kids are growing up and they're leaving me. I get it, you know. You start to take all these country songs that are so cheesy and you really go, man, that's life right there, you know. It moves fast. And I'm always amazed that the older I get, the faster life goes. I think it's just because, you know, it's just because you start to have more and more markers in your life. But I love this one line. It says this, live every day as if it was your last because one day you're going to be right. I love that. Live every day that's going to be your last, because one day, guess what? It is going to be your last day. And we really do have to get a different perspective on the time we have here, because we have no guarantee of time. And so how we live each day and how we see our life is really important. In fact, I, I, when I watched that story last week about that little seven-year-old life and the impact it's had, it really shifted me last week as well. We are not guaranteed. All we're guaranteed is this present moment right now. Nothing beyond it. We have no idea. In fact, Jesus' brother James, he knew this, and he gave this vision. He said this, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? Hold on to that question. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, and then he gives a different option, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live here, we will do this, and we will do that. James is starting to really lay out, lay out a different vision of how we can look at our life. One of the biggest questions you can say right now is what is your life? What is your life? What does this stand for? What do you dream about? When you wake up in the morning, what is top of your mind? What are you living for? What is at the core of your life? What is your life? Because James says, listen, it is a mist. It is a mist. It is this thing that just happens and goes. It is a mist. And one says it is a puff of smoke. It is a vapor. And if you don't live your life intentionally, it's going to be gone. And this is your opportunity. And James says, do you realize that this is the spot that you have right now in this particular time? How are you going to live that? And then he says this. There's an option. Instead, you ought to what? Go to God and find out. Instead, there is a place that can say where you should live, how you should live, what you should be living for, what you're designed to do, how you should be spending your time in this life. He says, you can go. You can go and find out where to God. This life is a mist. And it's funny to me, the older I get, the more I look back, there's one nice thing about living longer 
You can look back and say, I can't believe I wasted my time on these things. And for people in their youth, you want to go to them and say, don't do that. Like, go this way. Everyone's got their path. You'll say, look, would you just not do this? You can go here. You know, I told you last week that our family got a new puppy. And it was for my, my, my son's birthday is today. He's 22. He always wanted his own dog. And he said, hey, would you help me find mine? Oh, yeah, I'll find it. We found it. And we were bringing it home last Thursday. And I got the biggest kick out of it. Here's, here's, here's our little pup, right? This is Finnegan. And uh, he's, he's quite, quite uh, charming. Yeah, he, he, found, he found the toy box, which is not his, and he pulled out that amazing little uh, pig there that happens, he doesn't know this, but our 100-pound Newfoundland, that's her baby. So he got himself into some trouble. But that's her main toy. And I got the biggest kick out of a conversation that the two of them have. Because our 100-pound Newfie obviously is older, and then this little guy is only two months old, and he's looking at this, and he found this pig, and he thinks this toy is the world. And so here's the conversation I ha- that they had, and then I'll interpret it. Can you bring that up? That'd be awesome, yeah. All right, now I don't know if you caught what they said. Right, but I know how to un- I know how to <laughs> interpret that. But I love how the uh, our Newfoundland standing up there and looking out, not even acknowledging it. And this one said, "This is the whole world. Look what I found! Amazing! I'm going to pour my life into this." And I think the Newfoundland's like, "It's a toy. Doesn't mean anything. I used to think the same thing, but it doesn't mean anything." That's what they actually said. You know, <laughs> I'm trained in that kind of language. But I thought it was just an interesting, funny little moment that happened this week. And I watched that and thinking about this message. As we get older, we can start to see the things that are really not worth investing your life in. But we invest our life in so many different things that really are not going to lead to anything of eternal value. But we'll fight for them for a long time until all of a sudden something else is opened up. So last week, uh, the, the tagline of our week was, our groanings become our gifts. The things that we go through, the hard parts of our life, many times God will take that and push us into life. And that becomes a gift for ourselves and for the world. This week is our lives become our legacies. What we live for is what we leave behind. And it can either have eternal impact or it can disappear after it's gone. And I wanted to give you a visual of this. This is actually from a pastor, uh, Francis Chan. And I really wanted you to to be able to just see something in your mind. In fact, when you leave today, you're going to pick a little piece of rope. I want each week to have an icon that you can put in your pockets. When you leave, you're going to have a little piece of rope. But this is a rope that signifies eternity. And scripture says that our life is not just here, that our life will go on, that it's connected to something bigger. It says also that if you place your faith in Christ, it says that you will never perish, but you'll have eternal life with God. That means eternity, millions and millions of years. That's what this is here. This is what this actually represents. This eternity that goes on and on. Just imagine this wrapping around this building and then wrapping around the world and then going up to heaven. It just goes on and on and on. And this is your life. And you know what's interesting? Here we are in this whole scheme of eternity and this is our life. This is it. This little bit. And many times, you know what we do? We say, oh, wow. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work, 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 work. And I'm going to invest in these things. And I'm going to save, 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 save. I'm going to save all of this and all of this and all of this. And when I get to this part here, I'm going to have so much fun. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to do all the things that I ever wanted to do. And I'll just keep going day by day. And I'll keep going wherever I want to go. And I'll keep building, building just for this little moment. But we forget about this. Look at this. What would happen if we didn't think about that little moment of our life? Because we're not guaranteed all those years. We start to think more in an eternal way. Something much bigger than ourselves. If we start to think that way, guess what happens? This part of our life, where we are right now, we start to live differently. We start to look at things differently. I had a friend of mine, Pam, that I worked with for nine years. One of my very, very best friends. Six years ago, she passed away of cancer. And she, towards the end of her battle of cancer, uh, she was telling me that, she start, that God started to give her glimpses of the kingdom of God here on earth. And she started to say that I would be in the office and she would literally take her treatments and come to work. And I would say, go home. She said, no, I gotta be here. And she would say she'd be in the office and she'd hear conversations that weren't rooted in the eternity, in the kingdom of God. They weren't useful. You know what she'd say? I'm not listening to those conversations anymore. 
I'm not gonna listen to them here. That she would hear things on the radio or she would have all these different interactions. She'd say, no, I'm not gonna do that. And, I'm not. and she looked at me and she says, Danny, I think God's given me a glimpse of the kingdom of God here before I get there. It was this beautiful moment that opened up her mind to say, this life is not all there is. And if we start thinking in an eternal way, we start treating each other differently, we start treating ourselves differently, we start to not waste time on things that are wasteful, we start to see the world in a different way. I want you to have that image in your mind as we talk about one of my heroes of scripture. And we're gonna to try to talk about three incidents that happen in scripture that start giving us a clue to how potentially we can start to see our life in a different way. And the hero is Mary, Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany, I think, honestly, probably understood the mission of Jesus, who Jesus was, and why he came here before any of his closest disciples. In fact, there's, there's good evidence when you read about her that she really understood more than anyone else what Jesus was really here for. And because of that, she started to really commit to Jesus on a level that none of even his closest disciples did until after he was gone. So we're going to look at those accounts, three accounts, and the first one's going to happen in the Gospel of Luke, and I think you're going to see a pattern with Mary. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's, say it, feet. She sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by all her preparations that had to be made. And she came to him, God, and asked him, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. This is one of my favorite little moments in the Bible. Here's someone's going to God and telling God what God should do. It's awesome. We, by the way, we do it all the time. So here's Martha, distracted by her preparations and telling God what to do. And Jesus answers, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one thing. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. How many of you have been distracted by preparations? <laughs> you just put your hands up. I wasn't even asking for that. It's great. I know I am. All kinds of things that have to be done right now. You're looking through the list in your mind that the things have. You're distracted by all your preparations, all your work. I love this one headline that, that depicts this so well in the newspaper. You can bring that up. It says this, California man accidentally sets apartment on fire while trying to kill spider. This is a great example. It's a great example of someone distracted by preparations and missing the idea that his home is on fire. And many times we'll be distracted by all the preparations in our life and we'll miss the one thing that is right in front of us. And Martha is distracted by preparations, her busyness. Corey Ten Boom speaks so clearly to this. Corey Ten Boom was part of a family that saved a lot of Jews from the Nazi regime. And she writes this, beware the barrenness of a busy life. Beware the barrenness of a busy life. We like to be busy. We like to be working, we like to be doing things, but we beware of that because we can be distracted by the things that are not really the thing. The one thing that we really need to be doing will be distracted by that. In fact, I would say this, that evil, that is one of the greatest schemes of evil, that you're distracted and your, your, your gaze is pulled away from the one thing that you should really be focusing on. And so Martha is being distracted, but Mary has found something that we need to know today because it is the one thing. You've probably heard the phrase that we're human beings, not human doings. That if God really wanted us to be human doings, he would have called us human doings, you know. We are human beings. We are designed to be with God. We are designed to be with him. We were designed to be close to God. We are human beings. And Mary, I think, knew this instinctually or through the power of God's spirit. She knew this fact. She knew this, that our doing our doing has to come out of our being, not our being out of our doing. Our doing has to be, come out of our being, not our being out of our doing. Many times we really believe that it's our doing. It's our doing that will bring us faith. I grew up in a tradition that said, if you do these things for God, you'll actually be close to God. 
If you do these things for God, you will actually get the favor of God. If you do these things, it was always a works-based system. If you do this, you'll win God's favor. And in our faith life, many times we approach it like our human life. We believe that it's out of the things we accomplish and do for God that we achieve our being, our worth, our faith. But God is really clear. We do not accomplish anything apart from him. We do not accomplish anything apart from God. In fact, he says you can't do anything of eternal value if you are separated from me. That first we must be with God before we do things. Now don't misunderstand me. There is a ton of stuff to do for God. A ton of stuff on this earth to do. There are so many things on this earth that are broken and God is using his people to actually bring his truth and his light into darkness. There's an there's a, a organization called the International Justice Mission, IJM, and their whole mission is to end slavery, modern day slavery, which by the way is, is rampant in the world. And they're doing this through through legal systems, through local systems around the whole world. They're working in some of the darkest places and pushing against some of the hardest things in the world. And I remember one time hearing the president speak of that organization. He says, we never do any work. It is mandated. We, we, we don't do any work until in the morning all of us get together and we connect with God for at least a half hour, an hour. That's mandated. He said, I'm not gonna walk out and do the work of God in some of the hardest places without actually being with God. And they found out that it's your being is the most important thing. That your doing has to come out of being with God. And Mary knew this. She understood this. And it says, that is the, I, that is the one thing, the one place that can never be taken away. Being where? At the feet of Jesus, Mary is making a legacy choice. Our lives become our legacies. What choices we make today and what decisions we invest in during our time on this earth have eternal consequences. And Mary knows this and she chooses the one thing, to be at the feet of Jesus that can never be taken away. Everything else can be taken away in this world, but the one thing is to be at the feet of Jesus first. So that's the first part of Mary Bethany. Second scripture, we find that Martha and Mary have lost their brother. He was ill. They wrote to Jesus. In that time, he passed. Now he's four days in the tomb, and Jesus finally arrives. Martha goes out to Jesus first. They have a beautiful conversation, and then Jesus calls for her sister Mary. Listen to what happened. Martha went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up and quickly went out to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was in Psalm, she fell at his feet. She fell at his feet. Here's what we see. In times of joy, in lack of conflict, in a home, having a dinner, where is Mary? She went to Jesus' feet. At the time of mourning, the time of hurt and the time of pain, what is the instinct of Mary? To go to Jesus' feet. To actually go to God first in every circumstance of life. Now you're seeing the pattern of Mary of Bethany. Each time she experiences something, her first instinct is to go to God first, to go to the feet of God. And then here's the third scripture that I want you to focus on. John 12, it says six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. (laughs) Here's a beautiful part. Even though their brother was dead, Jesus entered in at that time and he actually raised Lazarus to new health and restored him. And so now Martha and Mary have seen Jesus work in miraculous ways and now they're here together again. It says they gave a dinner for Lazarus. Couldn't you imagine that? Hey, there's the guy that was dead and now alive, we might as well throw him a dinner. In this beautiful moment, they're all together again in a home having dinner. They gave it to Lazarus. Martha was serving, of course, but it doesn't say she's distracted by her preparations. It says that she's serving. That Lazarus was at the table with Jesus and then listen to Mary, where is she? Mary took a pound of the most costly perfume made of pure nard and she anointed Jesus' feet. The third story about Mary, where is she? She's at the feet of Jesus and she wiped them with her hair and the house was filled with this beautiful fragrance. 
of perfume. Here Mary is again. Every time she's in the presence of Jesus and every time she's submitted to the feet of Jesus. You can see the pattern of what's happening here. And then there's this beautiful scent of God that's filling the room. What are we living for? What is our life about? Where do we go when we enter in and all of a sudden people leave and there's this beautiful fragrance of the kingdom of God? I really believe that that's possible. And when that happens, when we're living this part of our life for something bigger than ourselves, when we're at the feet of Jesus, every interaction we have, everything that we do leaves this fragrance of the kingdom of God. What's interesting in this moment is Jesus has some of his closest followers with him as well. And you see the dichotomy between Mary and even some of his inner circle. One in particular, it says this, as the scripture goes on. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray Jesus, said this. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal from what was put into it. Here is Jesus one in his inner circle. And now what is Judas living for? He's been with Jesus. He's seen all of the stuff. And what is he living for? He's living for the wealth of this world. He's at the feet of the world. He's putting his faith and his security in the wealth and the riches of this world. And Mary, what is she doing? She's pouring out all the worldly wealth she has. In fact, what she poured out was a year's wage. Think about that. Think about your year's wage. Would you be willing to take all of that and just give it away right now? And that's what Mary's doing. That's the extravagant act of worship that's happening. She took everything she had, all her wealth, and now she pours it out on Jesus' feet. She's saying to Jesus, I trust you with every single part of my life. All my worldly wealth, all my sorrows, all my joy, everything I have, I'm gonna be found in the one place that can never be taken away from me. And Judas, who is close to Jesus and in his inner circle, says, I'm going to plate my faith somewhere else and my trust somewhere else. I'm going to have at the center of my life something that's not rooted in something eternal. It's amazing what Jesus says. He says, he defends Mary. He says, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for my day of burial. That's actually the hint to say that Mary actually knew more than even some of his closest disciples. She knew that someday that was coming and someday soon and she was gonna be prepared. She says, you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus defends Mary and then he goes even deeper in Matthew, another gospel account of this. He says, truly I tell you, whenever or wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what Mary has done will also be told in memory of her. Think about this. Every time the gospel is preached, Mary comes up underneath that and says, this is the perfect witness of what I'm talking about. Don't ever forget this life. Judas's life ended quickly and tragically. Mary's life is still being remembered and rooted in eternity. Mary knew that her life was but a mist, but that there was something far beyond that. And the wealth of this world can't get it, the sorrows of this world won't steal it, and the joys of this world won't fulfill it. But she's going to live for something so much bigger. This life. What is your life? What is my life? What is at the center of your life? What is the one thing? Jesus says, I'm the one thing. I'm the one thing. Whose feet are we worshiping at? What are you pouring your life out for? Creating a pleasing fragrance of God every time you enter in. Here's what I know. When a life is lived for eternal purposes, it has eternal impact. And so I want to share with you a story, and it's going to be told through the lens of a best friend and told a little bit through my lens as well. And we're going to tell the story of Elizabeth Dalton. It's a person that I didn't know for more than maybe 20 or 30 minutes, but eternally changed my existence, my DNA. I really believe that. And it's going to be told through a lens of her best friend, Jennifer. Jennifer and Elizabeth did ministry together in different contexts. They were best friends. Uh, They really had a passion for youth, and they really had a passion for children. 
Uh, Jennifer really, she was engaged to be married, but she decided that he wasn't the one and that fell apart. And they always had a pact between each other that if we reach a certain age, we're gonna have children somehow. And then as friends, we're just gonna raise them together and figure it out. And so both of them stayed single and they decided to then have children. And something happened in the pregnancy of Elizabeth that profoundly changed her life, but it did not change her legacy and not change her impact, her eternal impact on a community right here, even our own students uh, that we have in this church. So we want to tell this story. It's a powerful story. And as we do that, we're going to receive our offering. So if you're uh, brand new here, this doesn't have to be your moment, uh, but thank you uh, so much for being here. If you want to take part in this, beautiful. Uh, This moment is for us who say, hey, this is our church. (laughs) This is our home. This is the mission that we believe in. And so we're grateful uh, for the investment. By the way, this is an incredibly generous community. So thank you so much for that. Uh, We always say that uh, we're going to give you every option of how we give. We do that primarily too because we have so many people that join us online, so they need online options. And so we give in a number of different ways right here in the pouch on our website, kensingtonchurch.org. Also through texting 77977 to Kensington. And then you can also go to our app. And you can download our app. It's probably the best way to stay connected with us, not just for these kinds of moments, but on our app, uh, you can give there too. uh, And it's a great way to do that. But as we do this, Let's take in this story and watch the principles of Mary of Bethany play out in the life of Elizabeth Dalton. Liz was a beautiful mother. She loved it. She loved children. It was her lifelong dream to have a child. She adored Micah. She prayed over him, she loved him, she spent all her time with him, loved making him laugh. Relating to children, Liz just gave her all. Liz and I met at the church we were attending. At the time, I was a youth pastor, and she was looking to volunteer and help out with the youth group. Uh, She played many different instruments, and she led the worship for the teens at that time. So it was probably, you know, 25 years ago. Somehow 20 years passed, and you realize that she became your best friend, and Most of it was due to raising how many youth coming through and relating to them and getting to love them together and being a part of everyone's life that you became more a part of each other's life. I was engaged and we ended up breaking off the engagement. So I was heartbroken by that because I wanted to have children. And I talked for probably about eight years about it. You know, she's like, if I ever get to 40, we're still gonna have children. Each of us can adopt our own children, we can help each other out. When she turned 40, we looked at adoption and found out it was outrageous. We talked to one of our friends who was a doctor as she suggested doing it medically. Looked into it and that was 3,000, much better economically. So we decided to go ahead and both of us tried it. Liz was very unsuccessful at first. She dealt with a couple of miscarriages and things like that. I, on the other hand, got Josiah. Then she got pregnant. She was due in August 2018. Everything kind of changed when we went for her mid-pregnancy scan. I went along with her and her mother. We were there, and they said, hey, I think we found something. It looks like you might have a cyst on your ovaries. We don't know what it is, but we need to look into it. We found out she had, in fact, had stage 4 stomach cancer. Around 20 weeks, she started to have to do chemo with the baby. It was one of the only chemotherapies safe for her. They had to deliver Micah early. He was born July 2nd, and he was healthy. Liz's cancer progressed, and we had decided to stay home and that she was going to do hospice at home. We wanted her to be with the boys and be with the family because she was concerned for them. She was concerned for her family. Her 
first and foremost thought was that everyone knew her heart for them and that everyone was right with God. She started getting sicker and sicker, so it was less time that she could spend because she became very, very weak. But she at least was at home where she could hold her baby and love on Micah. Danny came to visit Liz and I at the house. I came in, shook hands, met everyone. There was two little beautiful babies there. Uh, the grandparents were there. And then uh, Jennifer uh, walked me down the hallway to see Elizabeth, which was her best friend. And we went right into the room, same layout as my childhood home as I used to sleep in, same exact thing. So I sat at the foot of the bed, I introduced myself to Elizabeth, we smiled, we talked, Jennifer sat down and we just started talking. And we talked about life and Jesus. Elizabeth was in and out of consciousness at that point. And so we just kept talking and sometimes I'd grab her foot and we'd laugh and we'd have these conversations. And then at one point, Jennifer said, hey, we want to talk about the memorial service that we want to do. And the minute she said that, Elizabeth sat up in bed and she was so animated. Okay, this is what I want and the service, I've already thought about it. I know everything and she got so much energy. And at one point she looks at me and she said, listen, I don't care who does the sermon. I don't know if you're gonna do the service or someone else, it doesn't matter. But I've already written my sermon and this is what I want you to say. And she proceeded to, to go through her sermon, what she already written and what she wanted people to hear from her. And I didn't have anything to write down, so I'm like, oh Lord, make you know, let my memory hold these thoughts. It was really neat because Liz was very weak. But of course, when you talk about Jesus, she became very clear-minded, very strong. She was able to share her, her strong faith with him and how much she loved her Lord and it was like someone who came in that was an old friend. When I got in my car and started driving, I thought, wow. I was, I was really moved by Elizabeth. I think I cried most of the way home. Um, when you see a young life, she's relatively young, you know, late 30s, early 40s, and you see kids and you see these things, and then you watch someone navigate it so powerfully. I don't know if she knew how powerful she was in her weakest state. The day of the funeral was really kind of a blur a little bit. Danny did the sermon. He did a beautiful job of sharing it. I had the honor to say, this is not my message. This is actually the message that I got from Elizabeth. And I'm going to give Elizabeth's message to you today. And then I proceeded to tell the message. What I learned from her sermon was amazing, actually, because uh, both her and her friend Jennifer were in ministry, their whole friendship. And they were in different kinds of ministry, so they connected with all different kinds of churches. And one of the passions of my heart has been unity. And the first thing that Elizabeth said to me is make sure you tell everyone that we are to be unified in Christ. God calls us to unification in John 17. And it re resonated with me because I've been thinking about that so much. And then she proceeded to say two things that I thought really changed for me. That our life is a vapor, it's this mist, that's what scripture says, it's just this moment that is here and goes. Make sure you spend your life on the right things. And then the last part was, what are you pouring your life out for? What are you giving your life for? And she got so passionate at that point, and she said, we have to give our life for Christ. That is the only thing worth our life. All the time I've known Liz, I've learned so much about Jesus, how to give yourself to him every day and every moment, how to make Jesus a part of everything we do and include him in our thoughts and include him in our lives and include him in our relationships. She was a very peaceful, loving person. She gave everything she had, and she'd be able to get anything done and organize anything. I hear daily how people miss her. She was a school counselor, and I still get Facebooked from the students that miss her and how they were impacted by how she loved them. More than anything, I want Micah to know that his mother was a woman of God and that her desire was that he grew up to be a man of God. And not at age 20 or 30, but as a child on, that he could be a man of God. The 
those kinds of lives and examples are the thing that actually have eternal value. Like that shaped my heart, that shaped my life. I barely know Elizabeth, still to this day, I hardly know her at all. But I can say that that moment in her faith changed me forever. And I was with her for what? 30 minutes of my life. And I'm different. I always wanted to be part of the crowd because I was safe, but it's not worth it. It's so much more, it's more fun too. Plus you get what you want in the end, hearing God say, you did what I wanted. You did what I asked. Isn't that a powerful story? And I really do believe that that's the part of the story that I think is so tremendous to me is I probably was in Elizabeth's present for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. And it profoundly changed the way I look at death, the way I look at life. She wasn't living just for this. She had an eternal view. She loved Jesus and she wanted Jesus to be pushed on through the next generation, to the next generation, through her own son. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, I, after that funeral that weekend, I told the story of doing this funeral, and one of our young students came up to me, and she said, is that Miss Dalton? And I said, yeah, that was Elizabeth Dalton. And she said, uh, well, let me tell you a story about her. He said, I was in middle school, and I was going up to this retreat, I think it was at Spring Hill, and I went there all alone. I'd never been to a retreat. I didn't know anyone. I was really nervous. I walked in. I was looking around. I was in you know, a lost. And this person came up to me and said, can I help you? And started guiding me through that weekend. And then all of a sudden I go to my cabin and she's the leader in my cabin. And she said, it was Miss Dalton. And she profoundly changed my life. My life is completely different because I was with her and because she noticed me and she saw me and she brought me to the feet of Jesus. Where is the one thing? Where is the one place? Jesus says the one thing that Mary has is being at the feet of, the G of Jesus first. It's at the foot of God. It's at the place where we surrender and we start to follow Jesus, that we actually start to see that this life is not just this life, it is bigger. And what we pass on, our lives become our legacy. What we live for, it becomes our legacy. It's gonna be a beautiful legacy through her son to be a man of God and to move out and to actually have that kind of vision. And so the team wants to end with a couple of musical thoughts that are gonna cement what we talked about as well. And as we do this, I would just ask that you really listen to this first song and these lyrics, let it speak to your heart, and then hopefully we'll have a moment to be able to sing these truths out together in the room.
We're going to sing one more thought together. And as we do that, I want to invite you all, whoever is able to stand, to stand. This song simply says, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself away. And really, I think that's the thought of the day. It's really that we present ourselves, as Scripture says, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. Presenting our lives, giving up ourselves, and laying ourselves right at the feet of Jesus. So Ashley is going to lead us in this, and we're going to sing this bridge out, because I really want us to grab hold of this, and so we can sing this thought together as we leave today. My life is not my own To you I belong I give myself I give myself to you My life is not my to you I belong I give myself I give myself it to you It's real easy My life is not my own My life is not my own To you To you I belong I give myself I give myself to you My life is not my I give myself, I give myself to you. Here I am. Here I am. Here I stand. Lord, my life is in your hands. Lord, I'm longing to see your Lord, let us continue to learn what that looks like. What does it look like for us to give ourselves to you? The one place that you can restore health, identity. Let us be able to see how you see us, the world, and others. We thank you for Elizabeth's story. We thank you for the eternal view. Uh, Father, would you please change our community and make us look more like you? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, thank you for being with us. Uh, when you leave, when you walk out, there's gonna be little pieces of rope. I'd love you to grab a piece and put it in your pocket, be reminded of this story. Next week, we're gonna be telling another powerful story about how to be an advocate. Someone spent nearly over 40 years in prison and someone really walked through that with them. Uh, it's a really, really powerful story. So we'll see you then. If you need prayer, come down front. Or we'd love to meet you out in the lobby for brand new or go to the hub. So have a great week.